Shalom Israel, and welcome to another edition of Yasha Allah Library. Today's topic that we're going to discuss is William Shakespeare and Psalms 46. The reason why I chose to go into this topic today is that there has been this teaching, this doctrine, that has been going around for the longest. I'm talking about probably since the 80s and maybe even earlier than that that William Shakespeare is actually the translator of the scriptures and through some mathematical formula that has been discovered by uh, archaeologists and scholars they have deduced that William Shakespeare secretly signed his name in the book of Psalms the 46th chapter now some of you brothers and sisters may have never heard of this philosophy unfortunately for me I've been hearing this since the early 90s since before I came into the truth and just recently at camp this Saturday we had somebody that came up after all this time and presented the same stale and false information to us as fact using it as an excuse as to why he doesn't believe in the scriptures particularly the New Testament so what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate to you the reasons why I say that that teaching and that philosophy is an absolute lie all right we're going to show you a video clip of a so-called scholar giving you the mathematical formula as to how he deduced that William Shakespeare uh, inserted his name in, into the book of Psalms chapter 46. And afterwards, point by point, I'm going to show you why his math is BS, man. It's a bunch of BS. And not just because I say so, I'm going to show you why. But before we do that, as always, we like to start off by reading a few scriptures. The first scripture I want to go to is a very famous scripture. Uh, the book of Romans chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? In other words, just because somebody doesn't believe in the Bible and the things written therein, does that mean because they don't believe that the things in this Bible are not true? Does that then mean that the prophecies in this Bible will not come to pass? Is that what that means? Verse 4, God forbid, meaning no, meaning as much as you want to call yourself an Egyptologist, as much as you want to read your Metunetter, as much as you want to take trips to Kemet, as much as you want to, uh, whatever it is that you want to do with Egypt as far as claim that or claim to be an Afrocentrist or whatever you believe, you still fall under the prophecies of the very self-same book that you don't believe in particularly Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 68 as much as you believe that you are an Egyptian you fall under the curses of the Israelites because you are the Israelites so just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not true yea let God be true but every man a liar as it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged okay so we're justified in teaching and saying the things we say because we say everything pursuant to the scriptures and whether you believe the bible or not the prophecies in this book have come to pass are coming to pass and as it is written in the book of deuteronomy chapter 28 the curses on our people are a sign that we are the people even if you believe in egyptology from there Let's go to the book of um, Habakkuk, chapter 2. I'm going to try to make this a pretty quick video. I'm not going to be too long-winded. This is not really something I need to spend a whole bunch of time on. Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. 
Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So the Bible says all the prophecies in this book will surely come. When? At the appointed time. So even though you don't believe in the Bible because your grandmother told you about Christ coming back 50 years ago, the vision is for an appointed time. And at the time, the vision is going to come true and it will not lie. The Bible has proven itself to be a true book. Simply Deuteronomy chapter 28 is a perfect example of that. Not the only example, but a perfect example of that. Now, moving on. When you get to the book of Psalms chapter 46, particularly uh, verses 3 and verses 9. In verse 3, the word shake appears in verse 3 in Psalms 46. When you read verse 9, the word spare appears in the book of Psalms chapter 46. So according to a mathematical formula, scholars have deduced and deducted that William Shakespeare signed his name into the book of Psalms in the book of Psalms chapter 46. So the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to let the so-called white man, the scholar, present his case to you, and I'm going to come behind him and show you all the reasons why he's going the hell off. Take a look at this. His colleagues, all his colleagues, were involved in the gunpowder plot. Therefore, therefore, <coughs> he had to write things in code. Now, to convey who he really was, he couldn't say he was Guy Fawkes or whatever, uh, he had to put a message in the Bible to who he was, or, or a, a, a book that, that people would read for generations to come. Otherwise, it would never be, be found. Uh, when he was 46 years of age, Shakespeare wrote this in the, in the James the first edition of the Holy Bible and it's he was 46 years of age uh, this is Psalm 46 and if you read 46 words forward you get the word shake and if you go 46 years words backward you get spear which equals Shakespeare now to, to let people know who he really was he got Shakespeare and then if you put the four and six together makes ten, it makes William Sly, Birmingham. So, it was really William Shakespeare and William Sly of Birmingham. So, Shakespeare was a Brummagem man. And I thought this would be worth putting up in the exhibition because it's of international interest. Ladies and gentlemen, that is madness. William Shakespeare did not, I repeat, not sign his name into the book of Psalms, the 46th chapter. William Shakespeare did not translate the book of Psalms. William Shakespeare did not translate the Bible. That is just another smear campaign and a tactic used to discredit the Bible. The same way people try to say that King James was a homosexual. That is another smear campaign and a tactic to attack and destroy the credibility of the King James Version Bible. Now, I don't want to go off into a tangent, but why, since I brought it up, the accusation, for those of you that don't know, that King James was a homosexual was leveled by a political enemy named Sir Anthony Weldon. He was the clerk of the green cloth. And what happened was he was expelled for, for political reasons from the king's court. Now, Sir Anthony Weldon, his family had served for generations in the king's court. So that was an embarrassment that he was expelled. So upon being expelled, he promised to get revenge against the king. Now, Weldon didn't get his revenge against the king in his lifetime. What happened was, when you read the history, Anthony Weldon waited 25 years, 25 years after King James and his son Charles was dead, and then he began making accusations that King James had confided in friends that he was secretly a homosexual. That's a lie. 
That is 100% a lie. As a matter of fact, if you know anything about King James at all, you would know that he, as King of England, wrote more books in his tenure than any other monarch of England before him or after him. And one of the most famous books that King James wrote was a book called the Basilicon Doron. And what that was was it was instructions for his heirs that would rule after him on how they should rule the kingdom. And particularly when you go to page 46 of the Basilicon Doron, King James instructed his heir to eschew to be effeminate. The word eschew means avoid. So he told his heir that he should avoid being effeminate. Now, why would a homosexual tell his son not to be effeminate if he was effeminate? Why would he instruct his son to do that? Because he knew it was a sin against God and he was not a homosexual. And when you turn two pages over in that same book called the Basilicon Doron, here's a quote directly from the king to his heir. And this is what it says. It says, there are some horrible crimes that ye are bound in conscience never to forgive, such as witchcraft, willful murder, incest, and sodomy. So he instructed his son never to forgive sodomy. What is sodomy? In a nutshell, going up somebody's rear end, particularly of the same sex. He told his son never to forgive that. You're bound in conscience never to forgive that. That's not, that doesn't sound like someone that's a homosexual to me. But the ones that try to smear King James in order to smear the King James Bible will only point out the accusations, but never point out these other facts that exonerate him of that. In addition, isn't it ironic that the man that translated the Spanish version of the Bible, Casiodoro de Reina, who also used the Textus Receptus to translate the New Testament into Spanish, isn't it ironic that he also was accused of being a homosexual? As a matter of fact, he was forced to flee England to Germany to finish his translation of what became known as the Reina Bible, which was published in Basel, Switzerland in 1569 and was later revised by Valera in 1602. Hence, you have the name the Reina Valera, which is the Spanish version of the King James Bible. Now, 10 years after fleeing England, Casiodoro de Reina was cleared of being a homosexual. And later on, scholars found records among the King of Spain, King Philip II, they found records that King Philip II had actually paid somebody off named Francisco de Abrino to accuse Reina of being a homosexual. And to this day, that stigma is still attached to the name of Casiodoro de Reina, that he was a homosexual, even though he was cleared of that, and even though records have found that the king of, uh, of Spain actually paid somebody to make that false accusation. Just like that stigma is still attached to King James. Just like this false doctrine about William Shakespeare signing his name into the book of Psalms is still going on to this very day. It's nothing but an outright lie, and now I'm going to prove it. Before I actually pull out the book that I have that discredits that lie, let's go back and let's listen to the scholar again. He says that, King, uh, that uh, William Shakespeare signed his name into the book of Psalms 46. So let's hear him say that one more time, and I'm going to show you how I know that that's an outright lie. Thank <laughs> you. 